Good day. Today we will be talking about hypernormalization in times of um, COVID-19. And um, this uh, webinar is organized by the Lincoln International Business School, University of Lincoln. And today we will be talking with uh, four colleagues of mine around this uh, theme. My name is Matthijs Bol. I'm a professor of responsible management. And this webinar is organized together with... First, we have Andy Brooks here a senior lecturer at the business school in Lincoln as well. Then we will be talking as well with Joe Hekpole, our associate professor in the same business school and the same department of management. Hello, Joe. Great to have you here. Hello, Mate. Yeah, great. Thank you. Then we will have Maria Kodowicz. Welcome. Maria is also a colleague of ours in the Department of Management, Lincoln Business School. And then finally, we have John Mendy, who is here, Hello. John. So John is also a colleague of ours in the same Department of Management. And today we will be talking about hypernormalization in times of COVID-19. And um, I will put up the slideshow immediately and start with that. So here we are, hypernormalization in times of COVID-19, how the absurd is normalized. So as I introduced you before, we have Andy, Joe, John, Maria and myself talking about this in the next 45 minutes. So what we are going to do today is first talk a little bit about what hypernormalization is and how we recognize it. Um, second of all, where does it actually come from? Hypernormalization was a term that um, was used to describe the late uh, Soviet Union, the last decades, and uh, we will talk a little bit about that, as well as is there a way out of absurdity, after which we will have a discussion amongst the five of us. But first, I will briefly introduce in the next 15 minutes or so, the concept of hypernormalization and um, absurdity. So first, what is hypernormalization? And um, um, no, hypernormalization in our work, as we describe it, um, is essentially the um, normalization of absurdity in contemporary uh, society, workplaces, and uh, social practices. And the idea of absurdity is somewhat absent from uh, management studies, but in our own observations and our discussions and our work over the last years as, uh, as the department um, in the business school, um, we cannot escape the conclusion that many of the practices uh, and uh, in society and in workplaces that we have observed cannot be described in any other way as um, as absurd. And um, we have two pictures here that represent such absurdities. Now, on the one hand, if we look, for instance, at the, perhaps the most prime example of absurdity, the presidency of, uh, of um, Mr. Trump in the US, there have been, of course, a variety of explanations about how uh, right-wing populism as a, is a... Is a uh, and, and a counter effect of uh, of 30 years of neoliberal capitalist uh, regimes and uh, which then um, has resulted in more right-wing uh, populism and so on. And so there are these kind of explanations behind the rise of Trump. But then if we just look at his presid presidency, uh, presi presidency himself, um, and, and the associated misogyny and racism and so on uh, into, the, uh, into the White House, we can no longer describe it as something else than mere absurdity. So um, this absurdity is also uh, um, present in, in the United Kingdom. And there is this nice story of, this, uh, of, of Dominic Cummings, who you can see on the right, 
Um, so, of course, there was a lot of controversy around his uh, trips that he made during the lockdown. Um, but there was also an interesting story about another absurd absurdity is and and that was when he um, um, retrospectively changed a blog that he wrote last year um, to include uh, a section on in which he apparently predicted the COVID-19 crisis so retrospectively he changed that as if he uh, correctly predicted the COVID-19 crisis and of course he being one of the most um, prominent governmental advisors in the UK currently. What we are dealing here with, of course, is the absurdity of these things uh, being possible in, in the government. So, from our um, observation of absurdity, we have to first, of course, ask what, what is absurdity? Now, the Oxford Dictionary um, describes absurdity as something that is wildly unreasonable, illogical, or inappropriate. So th this is, of course, a, the first key to understanding um, the absurdities in contemporary society as something that is so utterly illogical, but also inappropriate. Um, but in our understanding of hypernormalization as the normalization of the absurdity, um, we in our work we have also um, discovered that this um, this this focus on something as purely unreasonable or illogical or inappropriate is not uh, enough. So the idea of something that is merely irrational is not uh, sufficiently describing the absurdities that we uh, that we are trying to understand, because there's also another layer. Um, in hypernormalization and the understanding of absurdity, and that is the rising discrepancy between pretense and reality. And this is also, for instance, very um, prominent in the, um, for instance, during the COVID-19 crisis, um, when we uh, when we can observe that the pretense, so the, what is uh, what is officially um, uh, uh, dictated by governments or enunciated by governments, is increasingly discrepant from reality, and um, where this gap is ever increasing. So, for instance, it, during the COVID COVID nineteen crisis, what we have seen, of course, in the US, is that the president. Um, up to a long uh, certain point, um, far in March or April, was denying the gravity of the whole situation. Whereas the reality, with thousands of people dying um, from the crisis, was increasingly dissonant from what was publicly enunciated enunciated by by the the president in this case and this gives rise to an enormous absurd situation where that what is what is dictated by the government is 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 more and more distant from the reality of uh, of what is actually going on um, in a society and in workplaces so we talk about hypernormalization as the normalization of absurdity so these absurdities are not just manifesting they're also being normalized now normalization is very much something that is going on in every situation and acts as a social glue so to some extent culture itself can also be seen as as, as normalization of certain social practices and it plays of course an important social uh, function um, we can observe this now during the COVID crisis that something simple as the handshake is no longer permitted and the the handshake was always functioning as uh, and the normalization of, of of the handshake as a way of greeting each other and say goodbye um, acted as social glue but now we cannot shake our hand anymore and we have to devote attentional effort into saying uh, greeting each other and saying goodbye to each other so um normalization has an important role but if uh, the absurdity becomes normalized, we are talking about hypernormalization because then the absurdities are taken for granted and they are not contested. And so the effect of which, of a hypernormalization process, is that uh, social practice is legitimized, and um, which 
causes uh, that that uh, that in in societies people are not discussing certain social practices anymore because even though they are absurd they are uh, taken for granted they are so deeply embedded in society that they are utterly legitimized um, and then we can talk about a lot of things of course uh, absurd things in society um, and the normalization, so the process that emerges in society and workplaces whereby, um, whereby absurd, uh, absurd practices are uh, normalized, um, also delegitimize claims for, for a variety of effects. So in order to show that an absurd practice is absurd and thereby also causes a lot of um, um, uh, um, suffering in society, for instance, um, needs a, a, a lot of um, a protest and, and um, um, a societal uh, attention and problematization in order to for people to understand that a certain practice is actually um, absurd. Um, we can, of course, Let's talk about uh, about racism, which is one of the, the main debates currently across the world, where where the absurdity of racism and and institutional racism um, uh, needs a lot of protests in order to be recognized as as one of those absurd practices in contemporary society. Now. <coughs> What we want to do, of course, is to try to understand um, hypernormalization. And um, hypernormalization was coined by um, Russian-born uh, uh, anthropologist uh, Alexei Durchak. And um, it was described most notably in his, um, in his book um, with the beautiful title, Everything Was Forever Until It Was No More. So in this book, he tried to understand the last decades of um, the Soviet Union, so the post-Stalin decades after Stalin's death. And during the Stalin era, what you have is was um, what you had was that uh, Stalin was the supreme uh, master, so to say, who could dictate discourse. He could um, he could dictate what was uh, true and what was not true and so on. But after his death, there was this kind of void in which uh, it was no longer um, really clear to the to the to the rulers and to the people what um, was possible and what what kind of discourse could be formed in society so the rulers after after stalin's death um kept actually kept the uh, discourse under stalin and uh, try to reproduce it in 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 all the public um, uh, 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 discourses that were available. So we're talking about newspapers, about TV channels, about ideological speeches by the government, and so on. And where what way what uh, they were doing in in all of those uh, public um, um, annunciation was try to perfectly reproduce the. Um, the discourse that was allowed under Stalin era, under the Stalin era. So the, the reproduction of form was essential in order to, to keep the uh, Soviet Union uh, more or less the same over these decades. Um, but what you of course had was that the society itself was changing, but at the same time the discourse, the public discourse that was allowed by the rulers remained the same, remained frozen, so to say. So the reality, of course, cannot be described by these, these uh, public enunciations. So what you had was this increasing gap between uh, what was publicly, uh, um, uh, uh, publicly permitted to be stated in terms of uh, what, what appeared in the media, such as the newspapers, the Pravda and so on, and, um, and the TV and uh, public messages. Um, but the reality itself be became, of course, much more uh, um, dis distant from, um, from this, uh, what, was what was publicly enunciated. So to understand how people actually dealt with it, um, uh, Jurczak performed his research and he found that there were actually two, um, two ways in which they um, in which they dealt with this increasing uh, um, 
uh, increasing gap between public enunciation, the hypernormalist uh, public uh, discourse and re real practices and reality. So first of all, people needed some level of pragmatism um, in order to be able to survive in the Soviet Union. So they needed to engage in the performative dimension of ideology. So for instance, youth uh, had to be part of the Konsomol, the communist youth organization, and they needed to uh, hold speeches, ideological speeches themselves as well, in which they uh, perfectly reproduce the public discourse. So public discourse in which we have these empty signifiers such as uh, uh, brotherhood and solidarity and uh, and collectivity and freedom and critical thinking, all of those terms which are empty in themselves, which were um, reproduced uh, perfectly in ideological speeches, but which were increasingly become utterly meaningless. But that was not all because individuals through their pragmatism also found a, a more uh, creative uh, way in which they reinterpreted this uh, empty discourse um, into a more constitutive dimension. So which meant that they continued, and this is what Jurczak's research found, that people continue to believe in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in the, in the discourse itself, so in the ideals of the communist state, uh, freedom and critical thinking and solidarity and, and collectivity, all of those things which are which were uh, communist ideals as well, um, but try to um, uh, build uh, on a more constitutive dimension. So to, through creative reinterpretation of those ideals into their own situation, they found a way to move in between their duty, their the, the forced nature of be uh, of having to engage in the performative dimension, but also at the same time finding more creative ways to actually do something meaningful in their own communities. So if we look at more um, a contemporary forms of the hypernormalization, we describe it as um, as the illogical. So the 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 the, the the, the normalization of absurdity in contemporary society as the illogical and inappropriate nature of contemporary practices and the, the in, uh, increasing gap between pretense and reality. So these are the two fundamental elements to try to, to be able to understand a lot of the main issues of our contemporary uh, society and in particular the absurdity of it and the way through which this absurdity becomes normalized. So here are some examples, such as climate change, inequality, racism, and so on, and of course the COVID-19 crisis. But let's take, for instance, climate change. What we see, of course, is that the world is currently facing the, the destruction of the planet uh, itself. Um, so we are even though the COVID-19 crisis has, uh, has, could be also perceived as a wake-up call um, for, for the destruction of the planet, we are still confronted with the utterly um, um, uh, inappropriate nature of, con of, of human behavior at a, at a large scale in terms of our, uh, the destruction of our planet. So, for instance, even if we have 40 degrees um, of uh, in in Siberia at the moment, and uh, this enormous heat wave in the in the most vulnerable regions of the of the planet, we are still not acting, and so um, it is not just the inappropriateness of our in inertia vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change, but it's also the matter of this enormous gap between pretense and reality. So, on the one hand, what we observe is that governments are pretending to be um, mindful uh, of climate change and, and, and trying to address these issues, but at the same time, the realities uh, show otherwise. And uh, uh, certainly a governmental uh, um, inertia vis-a-vis -vis, uh, climate change. And we can also look at the other examples and we will do that shortly. So the question then, of course, is why is hypernormalization maintained and how can we get out of it? Now, the absurdity, why do people continue to believe in the absurdities of, uh, of our society? Now, to understand that, we have used um, 
uh, the the ideological meaning of absurdity, and in particular, uh, in 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 line with uh, Slavoj Žižek's work on ideology as 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 fantasy, which structures reality itself. So in this case, absurdity also has an important phantasmatic logic. It functions as a fantasy that structures reality itself. So, for instance, if we look at the refugee crisis uh, that is currently uh, for some years already of course going on in Europe we have this fantasy that we can just close the borders of Europe and keep those refugees out and that thereby the the problem is no longer there for us Europeans so this absurdity of closing borders and let uh, let all of those refugees just die in the middle uh, in the Mediterranean Sea of course um, has an important yeah. fantasmatic logic because it's, it's, it functions as a fantasy that we can just close our borders and that's it. And that we can live with this absurdity so that we can also individually deny the existence of this absurdity. That these absurdities exist around us and also um, are actually having a, an enormous effect on our lives. But as long as we can disavow, deny the existence of the uh, absurdity it also serves our own ontological security so um, a basic belief in in the stability of ourselves as human beings because if we um, if we acknowledge the existence of absurdities it also uh, causes a great ontological insecurity because we don't know lo don't know any longer who we are as human beings and what it is to, uh, to, to be a human being. This is, I think, also what you can see with the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, that it creates a lot of ontological insecurity um, among white people. They are, they are no longer um, have an idea of, of what the world will look like if things change, which then creates in this resistance against the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, but it is of course important to be able to address the absurdities in society, to address the absurdities such as climate change, racism and misogyny and so on. And we define in our paper and our work, we, we define the three-way strategy. Um, uh, consisting of problematization, resistance, and imagination, which are on their own insufficient, but jointly may um, cause or pave the way towards a way out, a possible way out of um, of of, uh, of hypernormalization. So first, of course, we need problematization, and again, in the Black Lives Matter movement, this is this is now very prominent, and it has been going on for years. The problematization of absurdity, the absurdities of racism, of continuing racism in society. Um, but that's not enough, of course, to change anything. The next step is, of course, because for, if we look at problematization, even the the World Economic Forum, so the, the group of people who are um, very much responsible for the, in, the great uh, inequalities and wealth and income inequalities in the world are now also problematizing the, uh, the issue of inequality. And of course, that doesn't mean that they truly care for inequalities and in resolving inequalities. So you can see that problematization is nowhere nearly enough. So the next step certainly is resistance, which of course we can again see in the Black Lives Matter movement. Now, this is an important step. We need to resist against such absurd practices. For instance, the Yellow Vest movement in the France, which originated in France, was also a, a primary and a, a resistance movement against uh, globalized neoliberal capitalism. And, uh, and is in, of course, is an, in, a hugely important step in, in, in getting out of the absurdity. But then finally, what we, and this is perhaps the most difficult um, uh, uh, step of the three, is that we need imagination. So very much the, I, an idea, a notion of how we can get out of um, uh, absurdity by imagining new realities. So we need appealing narratives about how a world could look like 
like not just not necessarily a world without absurdities because perhaps absurdity is very much part of life uh, as we know it but in the imagination of appealing narratives about how the world could look like in a in a more equal way for everyone um in, in on the planet and a way in which we can live our lives yet at the same time protect the planet from our own need to destroy it. So this is a brief opening in terms of, um, of uh, uh, what hypernormalization is and what the absurdity is. And now I would like to open the, uh, the discussion to my uh, colleagues and discuss in more depth um, what, what the absurdities are that we are now currently witnessing in, um, in the COVID-19 crisis. So I will, yes, this works fine, nice, fine right? So let's, let's uh, open up the discussion uh, among the five of us and discuss in more depth uh, hypernormalization in the COVID-19 crisis. So, um, perhaps Andy, you would like to start with your observations. Yeah, I think um, one of the things we tried to emphasize was that hypernormalization is a, is a useful lens, perhaps, to make sense of some of these phenomena that we're experiencing, particularly in society now. So, COVID has brought to the surface a number of inequalities and injustices. Um, that we've actually become have become normalised in society in some way. So, uh, but I think the challenge is, and perhaps it's the role of business schools, is we can perhaps talk about hypernormalisation at that societal scale. But what does that mean in terms of organisational and managerial decisions that that actually perpetuate some of those injustices and? I think one, one an example of that is the extent to which this gap between pretense and reality, that organisations <coughs> create a pretense of action through mission statements, through lots of their proclamations, and actually that becomes a substitute for real action. So there's a huge gap between what the organisations say they're doing uh, and the actual reality of the experience on the ground. So it... Issues that brought to the fore in, in, in the current crisis are that ethnic minority communities at least two or three more times likely to die from COVID. Ultimately, that results from some actions and decisions that have been made in organisations. So for business schools, I think we've got to help people have the imagination, perhaps, to be able to see those in their own practices and translate this wider social problem to what does that mean in our organizations yeah. and andy and and others as well and so you also point to the um, to the co-occurrence and of course this is not a coincidence um, that uh, first of all that that the covid-19 crisis has um, affected ethnic minorities to a greater extent um, than the majority um, and the 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 and then we see we also observe and witness the the Black Lives Matter movement, a, 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 a protest movement against institutional racism in the U.S., which has gone utterly global. So both have, of course, links to absurdity and and the normalization of absurdity. But what are also your thoughts on on the links here? Um, sorry, is it uh, to me? Yeah, if you want, Jerry, oh, right. please. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think there's um, quite a few things to unpack here in uh, um, the link between uh, COVID-19 and the normalization. I mean, uh, of uh, racism or normalization of uh, inequalities. Uh, I think uh, I'll touch on uh, the uh, health issue that uh, Andy uh, mentioned. But uh, let's come back to one of the key points that you've just made in terms of um, uh, uh, the uh, protest in, in, in the US at the moment. Uh, I think uh, one of the uh, critical things that we can observe that uh, points to the normalization of uh, racism 
is uh, the fact that um, after George Floyd uh, was killed, that uh, sparked all this racism, all, all this uh, movement and protest. Uh, in the same week, uh, there has been more killing by the police in the same manner, where the police had had their knees on the neck of uh, the uh, black person and uh, 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 killed them. And uh, other black people were shot down as well in the same week. And uh, around Canada, we had uh, uh, some native uh, uh, Indians that were shot in their houses. Uh, I mean, and um, uh, authorities have not been able to do anything at all. So that shows that uh, there's a perpetuation of um, racism uh, towards those uh, minorities, which is not uh, addressed. Um, authorities will say, yeah, we treat everyone the same. We uh, take uh, racism very, very seriously. But uh, there has been no vigorous action taking place to, uh, uh, to resolve the situation. Uh, so it's all about narrative. It's all about the rhetoric that is not uh, materialized in uh, concrete action. Otherwise, uh, uh, we, uh, we wouldn't be facing that situation now. So coming back to the health situation that uh, Handy uh, talked about, I think that's, again, another important thing. Because we know from statistics, we have the evidence that um, uh, black people and minority people are uh, disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Uh, why? The reason is that they have a poorest job, so they are more likely to get public transport. And this is uh, where you uh, get COVID-19 uh, more than other places. And uh, the uh, black and minorities are also more likely to be uh, frontline workers, uh, nurses, uh, healthcare assistants, uh, cleaners, and this sort of thing. So they are also more likely to get COVID-19. So we can see there a clear correlation between uh, uh, health inequalities and uh, uh, racism, because um, uh, black and minorities have often got the worst jobs, uh, therefore exposing them disproportionately to uh, uh, health risk and uh, other, uh, other issues. So I think and uh, um, uh, authorities have been uh, really prompt and keen to say, yeah, we, we acknowledge that this is a, a problem, this is a problem. But uh, no one has come up with a, a solution. This is what we do to really minimize that sort of a, a problem so that everyone in our society become equal uh, uh, before the law and uh, before economics. So these are uh, uh, extreme uh, uh, examples of uh, normalization of uh, racism. Uh, I don't know if you want to go to another colleague. I'll come back to some of this uh, point uh, uh, again later, but uh, yeah, I think I'll stop there for now for other people to be able to intervene. Yeah, thank you. Um, th those are very interesting points from, uh, from both of you and certainly fitting very well with the idea of absurdity and how they are normalized. Um, they're not, not just, but they are also um, very, what, what we, as the hypernormalization process, that these things are played down by governments. So we see this increasing gap as well between the rhetoric, official rhetoric and real practices. Yes, that is very interesting. Uh, Maria, you also want to discuss on the more psychological dimensions as well. Um, I do, yes, but I thought prior yeah. to that, just to pick up on Ju's point, so the authority response uh, in terms of this has very much been criticised as something that is more ticking the box. So yet another report has been commissioned, then we had the redacted report from Public Health England uh, looking into um, deaths in ethnic minorities from COVID-19, and um, the report, uh, the release of it was delayed on the basis of actually now not being the right time um, because of, um, you know, the public being unsettled. You know, arguably, this really is the time um, to make sure that not only we release reports, but as you say, do you, we take action. So I think here we can very much draw parallels with certainly what I experienced in very early childhood uh, growing up in communist Poland, you know, this notion of that Potemkin village, um, whereby uh, for, to impress Catherine the Great, Potemkin uh, built this kind of fake village, um, which uh, on the surface uh, looked, looked beautiful and appealing, um, but actually beneath that, um, there was nothing that served a purpose. 
and we can think of the Nightingale Hospital. So to use more healthcare examples, my, my own um, experience is in um, healthcare services. Uh, we built this, this hospital sort of off the back of, you know, Chinese success of being able to to create from scratch uh, these hospital buildings. Um, and uh, we had the same here, Nightingale, well, uh, to build the Excel Centre really touted as uh, Matt Hancock, the Secretary of State for Health Success in response to the COVID crisis. But of course, uh, we could draw parallels with a Potemkin village here, whereby um, for the majority of the time, Nightingale Hospital sat empty, uh, whereby more serious uh, cases uh, were more effectively medically dealt with within a local NHS trust. Um, so therefore, it becomes a smokescreen, a smokescreen of action um, without uh, actually anything of substance. Uh, so we're creating these, um, you know, you, you talked about um, um, Matthias of uh, Zizek's kind of um, ideology as fantasy and how we kind of blindly uh, embrace this fantasy uh, as a method of coping. So perhaps uh, before we move on to another colleague, because you, you asked me, Matthew, about these kind of uh, psychological uh, constructs, you know, my thinking here is maybe we can draw um, a likeness to sublimation. So when we think about the Freudian defence mechanism, so sublimation is one whereby we um, change our behaviours to more socially acceptable ones. And when one lives in a sociopolitical uh, climate where the state propaganda and, and the kind of top-down obfuscation and lies uh, deem certain behaviours socially acceptable. So, you know, we've had these very confusing messages about how to behave during COVID. Uh, we said we're following the science and yet, you know, Cheltenham was in uh, full glory with thousands of people gathering. So actually, there's a push for the socially acceptable behaviours to be the ones which actually go against the science, but meet the economic prerogative. But we failed this in following the science. So therefore, arguably, removing the blame from the government and placing it very much on the individual. So there is a rationale here for the mass populace to remain hyper normalised in order to maintain the strongholds of power and shift blame away from the government and from their own incompetence towards public behaviour. I'll leave that thought there for now and, and perhaps I can pick up on a bit more later. Yeah, thank you time. very much. That's very interesting. And um, um, another sign, another sign how it works out on the psychological dimension indeed. Um, John, um, you wanted to talk more about the um, the workplace as well. Because oh, yes, we are uh, after all in a business school. So um, yeah. Please First go. of all, I would I would like to touch on two important issues, which are which centre on one migration, and secondly, the use of the notion of flexibility within the workplace. Both of which, to a certain extent, have certain linkages, and their linkages are in relation to the way in which inequality has been perpetuated over a period of time. So first of all, all of us know that migration has been a major issue, not just in the Western Hemisphere, not just in America, but also in Africa and other parts of the world. Ever since the war, ha ha the wars in the, in the uh, Arab countries happened, ever since the uprisings there as a way of getting rid of totalitarian regimes happened. What we had witnessed over the past couple of years has been a surge in migration, mainly from Arab countries coming down to Europe. That's the first wave of migration. The second wave of migration has been one that has been coming from Africa, mainly because of poverty conditions, also mainly as a way of reacting against certain oppressive regimes in those countries, again, towards Europe. The third wave of migration has been one that has been going on from Latin American countries, mainly going towards, towards America. And again, as a reaction against the oppressive regimes and the living conditions in those parts of the world. The response by successive governments as a way of dealing with the migration problem has been one, as a way of shutting down 
those borders between the various receiving and countries of origin of migration. And secondly, there has been a push, especially within the EU bloc, to try and get the migrants back towards the Atlantic or back towards the Mediterranean. Mediterranean. Journeys which all of us are aware are fraught with difficulties, danger, harm, peril, trauma, and so on and so forth. So the question now is, how does the issue of hypernormalization come into play here? First of all, we see that these practices by successive governments at the political level has led towards what I refer to as a normalization of the absurd. The absurd here being that people are led, people in society are led to believe that they are being protected against evil people as migrants, evil in the sense that they have been portrayed by people like Trump as bandits, as rapists, etc., etc. And all of us are aware that in as much as you might have a few bad apples, not all the apples are bad. So it's a way of trying to pretend as if society is being protected against an encroaching and dangerous external force. What it does is in terms of a discussion, especially within the COVID situation, is it tends to deflect it tends to deflect the reality away from the health and economic problems and perils that most of these countries are experiencing nowadays towards a lesser lesser problem, if you like, which is the migration issue. The second thing I would like to highlight in relation to COVID-19 and hypernormalization is this whole idea of what happens within a, a much more mundane kind of situation, which is what happens within work. As scholars in management and organizational studies, what we are trying to highlight is the fact that the issue of flexibility as an item in which HR practices would normally tend to give individuals a certain degree of choice, which is the fact that individuals would choose to work in a very flexible way as a way of balancing this whole aspect of work and life. So individuals might like to spend certain days working in the office. Those same individuals might also prefer to spend certain days working from home as a way of trying to balance the commitments within work and outside of work. But within the current COVID situation, what we seem to be saying is an imposition as it were, of a good number of companies to say that everyone is now going to work flexibly. And this whole idea of flexibility has been in a way redefined to not only concentrate on what suits best for the personal circumstances of individuals to what now suits best for how organizations would now continue to capitalize on the current situation as a way of maximizing their needs as a way of maximizing their survival through COVID. So what we are currently saying is a normalization of a practice such as flexibility, which used to be one of personal choice to a normalization of flexibility to one that now suits an organizational set of needs. So what we see here is that absurdity at the extreme in the sense that absurdity is no longer only being manifested as Yushak originally painted it at the national or political or societal level, but absurdity at the organizational and even departmental levels. I will stop here and then allow colleagues to perhaps make comments and then I'll come in a bit later on. Thanks, Matthias and colleagues. Thank you very much. Um, uh, if there's anyone who wants to respond to any of the points made earlier, yeah, okay, yes, let's just do it. Go and yeah. yeah. Just um, just a brief reflecting while we've been been talking yeah. in terms of the importance of this lens to shine on behaviour at an organisation or political level, and I think this increasing uh, gap between the pretense, what people say, and the reality. Um, is important because it has an impact on accountability of people in power because when when things happen whether it's increased death rates or lack of delivery of ppe all of these 
concrete realities, actually, because we've got this separation between when people are held to account, they refer to the pretense. So they say, we've got a policy in place or we've got a plan to deal with it. And that almost deflects from the accountability. Um, so I think it, it was a really important um, that we try and highlight this type of behaviour that's become prevalent in organisations and at a political level. Yeah. Joe. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I think uh, I, I would like to uh, yeah, uh, thank all the colleagues. I think the interventions have been really um, uh, very enlightening. Uh, and I, I would like to pick up something that uh, Maria said before. Uh, when she talked about the, the new report that's been commissioned, and uh, it was with uh, great dismay that I heard uh, last week that uh, Boris Johnson, uh, our Prime Minister, is going to commission a new uh, report into race uh, equality. I mean, this is uh, uh, what Andy calls a pretense. I mean, these are used to legitimize uh, the inaction that uh, they have been involved in for so many years. We have the McPherson report after the Stephen Lawrence case. We have uh, the white papers. We have so many audits and reports that have come out and no action has been taken. And yet another report, another audit. This is really um, what I called earlier a rhetoric that does not materialize. In, in fact, that's a pretense that we've been talking about. Um, uh, so this uh, really uh, is not on. If we want to look at uh, uh, reality, we have to make the action of the, the, the narrative, but uh, at the moment we don't see that. Uh, reports have been going on in the United States, in the UK, in France, or uh, as long as uh, anyone can remember. But uh, no comment has been to uh, reduce racism or to uh, provide real equality. So in the end, Western societies uh, that are very, very keen on intellectualism and uh, very keen on um, the notion of renaissance that uh, uh, was born uh, a few centuries back uh, are not living that reality. And what is happening is that uh, we are completely ignoring people like Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau said, uh, and uh, we all study Rousseau, Rousseau said that people are born free and equal. And it's a society that enslaves them. And uh, with that understanding, we have done nothing at all to remove the oppression uh, okay. from people. And the people have been oppressed, particularly people from minority background, have been oppressed in their own land because colonization took place. And they are yet oppressed again when they come to the West. So we can see that uh, this uh, uh, narrative is not a lived uh, narrative and it's not a, a, a lived reality. And uh, that's what we call happy normalization, uh, normalization of racism, of uh, inequalities, of uh, oppression. Yeah, so I think we, we, yeah, Maria has made a, a very good case for the uh, new report that we uh, are coming again. Yeah, thank you. Maria, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to slightly shift focus, although um, lots of commonalities here. I think one thing that the pandemic has thrown up is the role of social scientists and the importance or otherwise of social science. I think all of us would describe ourselves as social scientists, would we not? And yet there's been a question that perhaps the government has been over relying on behavioural psychologists, for instance, uh, for guidance. Uh, so, you know, thinking about things like uh, economic behaviours or people getting tired of the lockdown. Um, when really the focus should have been on the on the hard science and the epidemiology, the virology uh, and the like. So perhaps one question should we, that should be asked is, is there still space in this hyper normalized reality for uh, the intellectual uh, uh, world? So is intellectualism, does it still hold space? Does it have impact? And my argument would be, so linking in with what you said, Andy, is perhaps it is our role as academics to hold to account, to speak up, to, to verbalise, to use these lenses, and not only to explain and, and to capture and document, but also to provide solutions. So I wanted to mention, because the word absurd has come up quite a bit, and um, the theatre of the absurd, there is a, a, a wonderful play called Tango, Tango by um, a Polish uh, author uh, and cartoonist, Sławomir Mrożek, which is an allegorical account of society in Europe. It also talks about generational differences. 
And the key protagonist uh, of the play, Arthur, he finds himself in a multi-generational household where chaos rules, so there are no rules. Uh, and he tries to find his place against this black backdrop in a society that is godless, uh, that is chaotic and that is corrupt. And of course, we can draw parallels here with, with a communist rule. Um, it's entitled Tango because uh, what it's saying is we all, to an extent, take part in these repetitive figurative dances where we allow certain patterns of behavior to be repeated and we don't contest it, we don't break away from it as Arthur tries to do because actually what we do, we end up repeating uh, these patterns and therefore we continue to pave the way for authoritarian rule, you know, be it on the left axis, on, on the right, you know, it's, it's probably far more circular politically than that. And what sadly happens to Arthur at the end is, is he ends up participating in the dance uh, in order to attempt to topple the leader in this familial household. So where am I going with this? Well, Gove said during Brexit, uh, when asked to uh, put forward economists who uh, disagreed, um, so who agreed with Brexit, he said people in this country have had enough of experts. So where does that leave us? Where does that um, leave us in terms of our um, raison d'etre, if you like, um, in a very kind of undercut uh, higher educational uh, institutional climate? Where really, I want to repeat that our role really is to hold to account, but also to create creative outlets, if, if you like, that could be a solution to this hypernormalization. So at the beginning in your presentation, Matthias, you said, well, what, what is the solution to this? And it makes me think of how the creation of, of new fantasies, if you like, through imagination, through the arts and through the literature have often been an, an outlet um, for populations to be able to create a new normality. Uh, so I guess the fantasy comes first, the imagination comes first, and then that slowly begins to embed where we are able to imagine a new reality. And, and firstly, you know, in the context of, of communist Poland, that then became a, a capitalist society. Uh, but perhaps I'll, I'll end on that note. I'll come back to England. What I really noticed is how colourful everything has become. So visually colourful, we were no longer existing in this kind of hyper-normalised grey reality um, of, you know, being told that everything is economically good, but actually having no food in the shops uh, and going hungry and having to queue for hours. A new colourful reality resurfaced. And I think it's up to us as academics to be able to draw up and create that new reality through our means, so through writing, through speaking, as we're doing now, in order to help break us out of that sort of tango, figurative dance cycle of hypernormalization into a new world, a kind of world that is more acceptable, more compassionate, uh, and less damaging. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, those are very wise words. Um, Andy, do you want to? Because of time, we we do not have that much time anymore. But Andy, would you like you you want to add as well? It's only briefly picking up on what Maria was just saying. I think we also need to recognise how difficult it is to do um, this imaginative um, exercise. Um, so I think a number of organisations like universities have, I think, made very sincere statements about. Uh, their policies against racism or declaring the cli uh, climate change emergency. I think they're sincere statements, but I think the real imaginative leap is to say how, how are injustices actually institutionalised into our practices. So management itself as an institution has got inbuilt inequalities and injustices. So for us to really explore how that's embedded in this dance, so we're continually creating this dance through our education as well. Um, so the, le the level we need to reflect on to understand that is, is quite deep and difficult to do. Uh, I think just uh, one second, and I don't think I'll take very long. And I think, Andy, you are, very, you are spot on uh, because the statement, uh, 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 just talk, um, I would want universities uh, to come up and say, look, 
uh, if we look at ourselves and uh, we can see that we have part of the normalization of racism. And these are the action point, the action plan for us to change to become more inclusive universities. But the statement uh, falls short of acknowledging their own impact and their own role in uh, uh, institutionalizing racism in, uh, uh, across the world. So I think uh, ac academia, uh, particularly the establishment of management, as you said, have been accomplices to the um, uh, normalization of racism. And uh, we, need, we need acknowledgement if uh, things have to change in the future. And this is not uh, transparent uh, in the uh, statement. It, it's become just a void statement in the end. Yeah, that's the big point I want to make. Yeah. John? I would also just like to make a quick point, which is in relation to how we have come to be within this kind of situation. And then secondly, a way out. How we have come to be in this type of situation of hypernormalization and, and absurdity is partly ingrained within, not just within our own political and societal systems, but also within the educational system. Over a long period of time, people have been taught in a specific way. They have been taught a specific type of content to such an extent that people have come to accept as given that society is in itself unequal. Then the second point is how do we get ourselves out of this hypernormalized, absurd types of situation? We've already started it, creating a platform of a counter narrative, a narrative which is different from what we have inherited from Yushak's type of thinking, which is a way of saying there's a need to create another space through which people can talk about a different type of reality a reality which is more complex, a reality which is more shared, a reality which is, or which provides a basis for greater equality, if you like. Thank you. Thank you all, thank you all. In terms, uh, we have to finish uh, because we, we don't want to uh, have a session of longer than one hour and we close up to one hour, but um, it is, it's, it's, it's hard and perhaps impossible to, um, to summarize all of our discussion into a couple of uh, sentences, but generally I think the idea of absurdity and, and how it becomes normalized in society does truly offer an, a, quite a, in, a, an important lens, but also quite a unique lens to study contemporary social practices. That is. That is for sure, and it helps us to better understand how things such as racism, th uh, things such as the 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 the, uh, the enforced uh, nature of uh, of future of the future of work um, becomes normalized, and 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 how sustain uh, or or sustainability or climate change becomes or is normalized, um, and the inertia, of course, particularly uh, is normalized, and the so the idea of 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 uh, of hypernormalization of absurdity as a, as a lens works quite well, and I. I I am sure that, that this discussion amongst us is just the beginning of many more discussions we hopefully can have in the future. And also, of course, focusing on, on, on these three steps of problematization, resistance and imagination. And what we are have been doing is a lot of problematization and we are we are also, it is a, perhaps our academic duty as business schools as well to to be much more engaged in the um, in the imaginative uh, 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 ideal of, of a business school as well in terms of thinking and 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 with our students with all of us in terms of how can we create a society and workplace that is more that, that more no that is truly equal of course and so on so I want to thank you uh, very very much for participating and I hope. Uh, we can have much more of uh, this kind of discussion in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. And now I think we can uh, end. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you.